So um, it's my real honor next to introduce our third speaker for the evening, uh, Dr. Virginia Lee from UPenn. Uh, Dr. Lee is the John Ware Third Endowed Professor in Alzheimer's Research in the Department of Pathology Laboratory at Penn. Uh, she has a degree from the Royal Academy of Music from London uh, and degree in Bachelor's in Chemistry and Masters in Biochemistry, also from London, from my old town as well. And uh, she has a PhD from UCSF. She has an MBA from Wharton School at Penn. And she is a legend in the field of neuroscience. So anyone who does neuroscience research probably already knows her name. And tonight she is going to talk about untangling progressive brain diseases. So, welcome. So, actually, um, did, I, did I just press, I didn't press anything, did I? No. Okay, go back, go back, yes. So that wasn't the title that I gave you, but in any case, um, but that's sort of similar to the title that, 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 that I gave you as well. And so, um, so, I thank you for your introduction. But, um, you know, for those of you who can't decide on what you want to do, and that's what you're looking at, okay? Because I studied music, and, you know, I did a PhD, I still didn't know what I wanted to do, so that's why I went to Wharton School. But here I am, many years later, and I'm still a scientist, so it's really one of the most interesting areas that you can get yourself into, because it's, you're learning things all the time, you're discovering things all the time, it's just fantastic. So, so um, well, here, maybe I'm holding it wrong, maybe I'm pressing it. That's probably the problem. I was holding it on, my, on one hand. Huh? Oh, I yeah. Mm. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, so how many of you actually know of someone and, um, that have Alzheimer's disease? Okay. So yeah, so a number of you. And Parkinson's disease, yes. So it's about equal number. And so I, th I think that you probably know that all neurodegenerative diseases, and particularly Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and are characterized by the accumulation of misfolded protein um, in the brain. What do I mean by that? So you see all these pathology that are shown here. So what do I mean by that? So that's why I'm carrying the menu, because you open the menu, you can read, you know what you want to order, but then it becomes misfolded. <laughs> so what happened? Anyone? Yeah, read it. Yeah, read it. So which means that it's means that it's lost of function, right? So you can't you can't read it, you can't do what it's supposed to do. And also there's a gain of toxic function because of accumulation of trash in your brain. So what you're looking at really literally are trash, a trash in the brain. So in Alzheimer's, there are two types of trash. There are these amyloid plaques. I'll put it down here so I don't eat it anymore. <laughs> and, um, and, so, um, and also, there, these are outside the cell. And then also there are things that are inside the cell, and they're called neurofibrillary tangles, and they're comprised of a protein called tau. And then in Parkinson's disease, and they accumulate another protein, and call, uh, they're, they're actually, the pathology is called Lewy bodies, and the building block is a protein called alpha synuclein. And so you see that these are all the different neurodegenerative diseases. So my laboratory actually um, identified tau as a building block for tangles in Alzheimer's disease back in 91. And then we actually showed that alpha synuclein is a building block of Lewy body back in 97. And then very, not very recently, 10 years ago now, almost, that we actually show that the pathology, they accumulate in brains of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And also another disease called frontal channel degeneration are comprised of this protein called TDP4A3. So for today, I just really want to focus on tau and alpha synuclein. And the reason why I want to focus on these two proteins is that they are, belong to the same class in the sense that they accumulate in the cytoplasm of cells, you know that the cell and the nucleus and cytoplasm, whereas TDP4A3, the accumulation of some of it is in the nucleus, 
but both tangle and Lewy bond are uniformly in the cytoplasm. And so, do we know the pathology? And um, what else do we know about these diseases? And so, a, a neuropathologist by the name of Heiko Brock and many others too, actually showed that, um, that the pathology progressed in a stereotypical manner. What do I mean by that? It means that it has a pattern. So, so you take a thousand Alzheimer patients, okay, and then you look at the brain and, and look at the distribution of the pathology. What do you see? Let's look at tau. So you always see the pathology starting in the same region where there's very little pathology. And it seemed to start in the lower brain stem, the locus cerebrus. And then it then spread to other parts of the brain, to the hippocampus and to the frontal cortex, and then eventually throughout the brain. So there's a progression. And also other work showed that this progression of Alzheimer's disease and, and Lewy body and disease correlate with the clinical progression as well. So in other words, that when you have not very um, you know, demented, for example, then you might have early stage and you have little pathology and you find it in the same spot. And when the disease is very severe and then you have pathology all over the brain. And so we're really fascinated by this and how we can study this and what it mean, what does it mean by spreading. So, so what it means is that when you really think about it at the molecular level, and you have a bad cell that has this trash that I just showed you, this photo, and then how does it spread over time? So what we think happened is that this misfolded protein somehow get out of the cell. And then they also get picked up by a neighboring healthy neuron, no healthy cell. And then what it does is that it starts corrupting the endogenous protein to adopt a bad conformation. So you can see eventually then the pathology expands and then it's spread again and then that's how it keeps going. So how can we study this phenomenon? So what we decided to do is to try to see if we can initiate this reaction in mouse brain. And so what we did was that we took a little bit of this what we call preformed fibers. So you can make amyloid fibers. So these tau, tangles, and Lewy bodies, they're comprised of amyloid fibers. But you can take protein that are made by bacteria, you can trick bacteria to make gobs of this protein, you can purify it, and then you can define conditions. You shake them in the test tube and so on, and you make it form fibers that look exactly like the ones you see in brains of Alzheimer's and Parkinson patients. And then you sonicate it and break them down into small pieces. And then the reason why that's necessary is that because these large you know, fibers cannot get inside the cell. And what we did was that we just injected directly into the brain. And in this particular case, we injected into the hippocampus. And so what we did was that we injected, and then we waited. And then we wanted to see what happened. And this is in, in a transgenic mouse model with tau, um, overexpressing tau. Now you see that one month after we injected into the hippocampus, you see pathology developing in the hippocampus, in different parts of the hippocampus and also actually in the other side of the brain. So we injected on this side, we now see pathology on the opposite side. And the pathology actually increased over time, whereas now you see the contralateral side, the opposite side, becoming increasingly abundant in terms of the pathology. And then we, up at six months, you see even more pathology. So that suggests that the pathology somehow can spread and, um, and increase over time. And so, in fact, how do we demonstrate this whole spreading? So, remember, I said that we injected into the hippocampus, which is right here. We're looking now in the locus cerebellus, which is another part of the, of the, the, the brain, which is down deeper inside your brain stem. Now you see that this is the, the same side where we inject. You see now the brown cells here, and these are the abnormal pathology accumulating inside neuron in the locus cerebellus on the same side that we inject, you see the pathology. And you, know, you see that on the opposite side, there's a little bit of pathology as well. Okay? And so now we've demonstrated that, that 
tau can spread. What about alpha synuclein and Parkinson's disease? And more importantly, we want to really try to do it in animals that don't really overexpress tau synuclein. You know that we engineer mice to make a lot of bad protein, and then you can get them to do things. But that's very, very unnatural. Because the human disease really don't have overexpression of, the, of tau synuclein, any of the disease protein. And also, the other thing is that if you look at brains of, of Parkinson's patients, and you know that they have movement disorder, and you know what is, that is due to, right? That is because of the, the fact that the cells in a particular part of the brain, called the substantia nigra, pass compactor, and that make dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that facilitates many, many different functions in brain. And so, and as it turns out that those cells that make uh, dopamine, particularly in human, they, um, they're brown because they make another substance called neuromelanin. And just like your melanocyte, they have pig, they're pigmented. So you see that in Parkinson patient, there's this loss of the cells of this, the pallor. And it's not like the control, which is you know, quite dark and because of the neuromelanin. And so that's one of the pathology. The cells that make dopamine are gone. And then the other cardinal pathology feature of Parkinson's disease is the accumulation of Lewy body. So what we want to uh, show is that whether we can demonstrate this transmission in wild type mice. And also we want to know whether there's a relationship between these two pathologies. Why do they have these, just these two pathologies? And so particularly we want to know whether or not there's a relationship between Lewy body formation and also the degeneration of these uh, 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 dopaminergic neuron and motor deficit. And um, the current models are, are not, they're, they're really truly really imperfect. So you can kill the dopaminergic neuron by giving the animal a toxin like MPDP or 6-hydroxydopamine. And also, we and many others have um, made models that overexpress avacinuclein, but these cells, the dopaminergic cells, they don't develop pathology and they don't die. And so basically what we thought, this is a great opportunity to see whether we can link these two pathology together. So how do we do that? So what we do is that, actually I didn't have that slide, but what we do is that we inject it in a specific region of the brain that make connection with um, the, the, the substantia nigra. And so in other words, that we want to see whether injecting one site in the neurons project to that site whether they can pick up the seed that we um, uh, injected and to see whether, whether there is pathology. So the pathology is characterized by the presence of this uh, marker, which is phosphorylated alpha synuclein. So you see that even at 30 days, we see some pathology near where we injected. And then by 180 days, you can see now the pathology in many different regions, including the amygdala and the striatum and the opposite cortex. But more importantly, you can see that the neurons in the substantia nigra post compactor that make dopamine, they're marked by this enzyme called TH, calcium hydroxylase, and they also have Lewy body. So we achieve goal number one, so we can see pathology um, in, 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 in brain and that spread um, over time. What about the second point I want to make is that do these neurons that develop pathology in the nigra die? And so this is what we did, and they indeed do. So what we did was that we look at, the, I showed you that we stay for this enzyme that make dopamine, calcium hydroxylase. So what you're seeing in brown instead of the, the green that I showed you in the earlier slide, and that they mark dopamine uh, making neurons. You can see now that if you compare that at 30 days with the other side, so you know, the, the, the ipsilateral side, one side of the brain and the other side, they don't talk to each other. So actually it's very convenient. We can take a slice of the brain and one side is the control, and to the other side that, it's, that we injected. So at um, 30 days, nothing happened, but at 90 and 180 days, you see progressively loss of dopaminergic cells. So basically, because we see the pathology first before we see neuron loss, as shown here, so we think that there could be a cause and consequence of development of pathology eventually causing the demise of um, these cells. And then, as I mentioned, that one of the reasons why these mouse, that, they, that we want to show that they actually do have 
a motoric phenotype, so Parkinson's disease, are characterized by, uh, by um, uh, movement disorder. So, it's in, in, so this is just measuring um, uh, its ability to balance on the beam. And this test basically measures the strength, the grip strength of, of the pores of the mice. You can see that over time, particularly in um, the strength, you can see that over time that is dramatically reduced in the grip strength. Um, and so, but these mice are cognitively okay. We did a number of, of tests to look at their memory, learning and memory. They're perfectly okay. So this observation that we did in mice actually has been extended to rats. So um, and, uh, Katrina Palmier at uh, Michigan State University did exactly the same experiment that we did. And instead of mice, and she used rats. And the same thing happened. She see pathology, as you can see here in the red, uh, the Lewy bodies. And also, you can see now the same thing. There's loss of dopaminergic cells here. And she actually measured the amount of dopamine in the stridum, in the part of the brain where um, you know, these neuron projected stridum. You can see now there's a loss of and dopamine after six months and um, injection. And another colleague of mine can actually reproduce what we found in non-human primates, and this is huge. So basically, what we did here is that we uh, he injected a little bit of the fibers and in the striatum, and um, you can see that now there's pathology here. The light may not be so clear, but this is pathology, and also in the frontal cortex, and a, a little bit in the substantial nigral cost compactor. So this is an ongoing study. Um, the monkeys now, I think that they've survived for about six months. This is about three months and after uh, injecting the fibers. So this is really huge in the sense that you can show, that demonstrate the same concept, the same mechanism of disease from mice all the way to non-human primate. And so, so now we have all these systems in place. How do we take advantage of these models to come up with potential therapies? And what are the ways in which we can and stop disease? And so I, I showed you the slide already, and that you know the misfolded protein to get out and then and pass on the next cell. So the opportunities are you can block the release of this misfolded protein, and or you can actually block the uptake of the misfolded protein into new cells, or you can actually prevent the seeding inside the cell, or you can promote the degradation of the misfolded protein outside the cell. And so I'm just going to use one example to block the uptake and of the misfolded seed. And so what we did was that we used a nuclein antibody, and then we want to know whether or not it will actually work to reduce the pathology and reduce cell um, loss. And then what obviously we want to know is what is the mechanism of action. And so, so basically what we did was that we um, injected the fibers into these mice, and actually we waited about a week. So actually this is an intervention, because at one week already, that we have, you don't see this, but there's pathology here and developing already after one week. And then we gave antibody every week. Oh, I'm sorry, I, this is too fast. No. And so um, we gave antibody weekly for about six months, and then we sat the animal at the end. But we measure along the way their grip strength and using the y hand test. You can see that after four immunization with the antibody, that they're already they're recovering. They, they're actually their strength is um, is back to normal. And we actually look at them after six months of treatment. You can see that there's a reduction of the amount of pathology and in one part of the brain in the amygdala. And we also show that the same treatment result in um, a reduction of the loss of, of cells that make dopamine. And you can see here the treated is actually have more cells in the substantial nitroplast compactor than the control. So what is the mechanism? Th these are busy slides, and I don't want you to really, you know, and um, it's good to try to see, and particularly the light isn't very good. What, what I just want to share with you is that we grow neurons, primary neurons, in the dish. And so this is what, these are primary neurons in the dish. And then we dump in the fibers. Okay, and you see pathology, and so this is a cell model. In, in, in addition to animal model, we can actually do cell model. And so they, they develop pathology, now, but at the same time, we also dump in antibody. 
And what happened was that we actually showed that there's a dramatic reduction in the amount of pathology in these cells in culture. So that's all fine and good because, and, I, uh, and so that's actually, you know, the cells have phenotypes, so I don't want to, it would rescue all the phenotype that, uh, that we looked at. But uh, more importantly, and um, yeah, what we want to do is to show that the antibody can block spreading. So, you know, when you add the antibody to the dish, and, you know, it's right there, and then that's pathology, it's just, you know, bind to the, the fiber, so it prevent it from entering um, the cells. But, but I haven't really shown you that this blocks cell-to-cell -cell transmission. And so, again, this is a complicated slide, but all I want to show you is this, this is a, a, a device where you can grow neuron in three different chambers. So you put neuron in chamber number one, two, and three. The only way they can talk to each other is through these little grooves where only axon can go through. And so also that the, the fluid dynamics of the device is that um, it goes to allow only molecules to go this way. I mean this way, I'm sorry, and not this way. So you, you add something in chamber number three, okay? And um, so in other words, that the, the medium volume is this way so that you know, the material can go this way, but not that way. So basically what we did was that we added the fibers in chamber number one, okay? And, um, and then we added the antibody in chamber number two, okay? And also that the fibers that we added to the culture is missing the, the epitope, in other words, the recognition motif of the antibody. So basically, whatever that we can see a reduction in the pathology in chamber number three has to do to the effect of the antibody blocking the passage of the transmission of the pathology from chamber number two and number three. And lo and behold, we actually saw that in our system. And so basically, this is one way of showing in cell culture what we try to prove in animal that antibody actually reduce the pathology by blocking cell-to-cell -cell transmission and, um, of, the, uh, of the pathology. So basically, the conclusion is that the antibody works and, um, and they basically, you know, it, it, they reduce the amount of pathology and ameliorate the neuronal loss and motor deficit in this wild type uh, and mice of Parkinson's disease. And, um, and the way in which it works is that it reduces pathology and by blocking the cell-to-cell -cell transmission and through the inhibition of the uptake of these misfolded um, and endogenous avicen nuclei. And so my last slide, uh, the people that actually did the work, um, so I, I, I actually, it's not very many people, because people know that I have a large lab, but this is the group of people that actually did all the complicated studies that I, I uh, um, described to you. And I, I, these studies are done in collaboration with John Trojanowski. This is our funding source, so I thank you for your attention.